Welcome everybody to the Latinas Lead Virtual Leadership Ser Series. My name is Rachel Griego and I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy for the Latino Community Foundation, LCFC. LCFC is super excited to welcome the amazing writer and truth teller, Prisca Dorcas Mojica Rodriguez to our show today. This is our second event in our Latina Leadership Series. Today's authentic exchange is being brought to you by LCFC. Your fellows, Next 50 Initiative, Excel Energy, and our community partner, Inspire. Through its partnership with high schools and universities across Colorado, Inspire invests in youth to become change agents in their schools, their families, and their communities. Through its programs in leadership, mentorship, and civic engagement, they, they, they do this work across the state in Colorado. Thank you, Jesse Ramirez for your continue, continued leadership and your support of LCFC's work. In addition, um, I'd like to thank our LCFC colleagues for their hard work in bringing this event to you today. So before we begin, I wanna briefly tell you a little bit about the Latinas Lead Giving Circle. It was launched in 2016, and the Giving Circle exists to strengthen the leadership development of Latinas uh, in their personal and in their professional lives. The Circle is a community-driven uh, uh, program, and it's powered by small donations. Annually, we distribute around $10,000 to small organizations in Colorado that are dedicated to growing the professional and personal leadership of Latinas. At the end of the program, you'll have an opportunity uh, to visit our website, go to our Latinas Lead uh, page, and hopefully we can encourage you after this program to invest in Latinas in Colorado. We're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping before we get things going. We just wanna make sure that everybody um, is going to experience this in the best way possible. We have simultaneous translation available for our Spanish speaking participants. Indira Guzman, founder of the Community Language Cooperative has joined us as our interpreter for the event. So we thank her for all of the work that she does around social uh, language justice. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you the directions for, uh, for uh, accessing this this element. If you are not bilingual in Spanish and English, we ask that you please click on the interpretation icon that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you have a if you're on a computer, if you are on a phone or an iPad, uh, please click on more or on the three dots that you find on the interpretation e um, icon. Select the language you'd like to participate in. And if you are fluently bilingual, free, feel free to keep it off and listen to all the original speakers. I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Diana, who is now going to give these instructions in Spanish. Si usted no es bilingüe en español e inglés, le pedimos que haga clic en el icono de interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla, si está en una computadora. Si está en un celular o iPad, haga clic en más o en los tres puntitos para encontrar el icono de interpretación. Seleccione el idioma en el que desea participar en inglés o en español. Si usted es bilingüe con fluidez, siéntase libre de mantenerlo apagado y escuchar los, todos los participantes en ambos idiomas. Gracias a todos. Thank you, Diana. So all participants have been muted uh, to avoid any noise or other disturbances during the discussion. Uh, we have some planned Q&A for uh, participants toward the end of the hour. We're going to be collecting questions. So as you think of them after Vizca um, gives the stories and there's commentary, we encourage you to start putting in uh, those questions into the Q&A box. Uh, please note that the event um, is a virtual event and it's being recorded. Um, and we will plan on posting this publicly uh, after the event on our social media as well. In addition, at the end of the event, we're gonna post a survey. We'd love to hear from you on what you thought of the event and the content and also about what you'd like to see in the future. So please take a few moments after the event uh, to give us your feedback uh, and let us know how you, um, how you like the event. So today we have over 250 participants that have registered. Uh, we're curious to know who these participants are. So we're gonna do a few, uh, a few poll questions uh, to to ask some things. So the first question, if you want to bring that up. The first question is what generation do you belong to? I'll give you a few, um, a few seconds to go ahead and answer that. Uh, 
All right. We're going to close the poll. So get your get your answers in. Let's go ahead and see who we've got. Wow. So for um, it looks like we're uh, the bulk of the group, 65% are millennials. We've got some Gen Xers, have some baby boomers, and uh, we have some Generation Z participants as well. But I think the bulk is, is millennials. Perfect. Um, the next question is, um, we want to find out where you're at, where, you, where are you located at, and where are you calling in from today? All right, let's go ahead and see what we've got. Wow, bulk of the people we have, we have actually uh, people from all over. We have a lot of folks from Denver Metro area, Front Range, Western Slope, so Grand Junction area, I'm sure. Uh, we have some folks from the San Luis Valley down south, Eastern Plains, and probably quite a few people that are even from out of state. So thank you for, uh, for taking place and are participating in that, in that poll. Um, so now we're going to start the program. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Leticia de la Vara, an amazing friend, a Latina leader, education advocate, and chief of staff for a national education nonprofit called TNTP. Uh, this is an organization that partners with schools, districts, states, and charter networks across the country to identify unique solutions uh, for effective student engagement and education equity. Welcome, Leticia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel Griega, Leta, Griego, excuse me, a Latina force in her own right, comadre of mine, and um, all around amazing woman. I'd also like to thank LCFC and the Latinas Lead series. Uh, really because as we face uncertain future and have more time with our thoughts, our fears, and our hopes, events like Latinas Lead are so important to remind us of the inherent power of being a woman of being a Latina, um, and really more than anything, of, of being a force. So tonight we'll hear from a storyteller and feminist, uh, Prisca Dorcas Mojica Rodriguez. She'll share readings and that explore Latina leadership, identity, self-awareness, and empowerment. Um, but before she gets started, I just want to um, do a quick intro of Prisca. She has a long relationship with the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, serving as the keynote speaker at the inaugural Power Summit in 2017. Prisca is born in Manawa, Nicaragua, but calls Nashville, Tennessee home. She started the platform Latina Rebels, which I highly encourage everybody to check out. Started that in 2013, has been featured in Telemundo, Univision, Me Too, Huffington Post, Latino Voices, Guerrilla Feminism, Latino Mag, Cosmopolitan, Bustle, the list goes on and on, uh, just to name a few of them. But currently, Prisca is writing her first full-length book with Seal Press from Hatchet, which is due out in spring 2021. I've had the um, distinct pleasure of hearing her speak live and reading her, her writings before. So I'm very excited to welcome Briska. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. I think we're just gonna jump in because we don't have a lot of time. So I'll start with like basics. Um, I use bad words. That's a thing that I do uh, because I, I grew up with, in a very Pentecostal conservative household. My papi is a pastor and I did everything right, right? Like I obeyed, I followed the rules. I read the Bible like nine times by the time I was in fifth grade. I mean, like I was in it. And then I, at some point I realized that People didn't care how well I behaved. It didn't actually matter. I was still read as brown. I was still read as Latina. I was read as an immigrant. And so I came to the conclusion that if someone wants to devalue what you have to say, because you're a woman, because you're Latina, because you're an immigrant, they're gonna devalue you no matter what you do to appease them. So I curse <laughs> as a way to reclaim my voice that I didn't have for a really long time in my household. 
And I also tell a lot of stories as a way to speak to people because chisme is way better than a lecture. And that's just a fact. And also, I think it's a really wonderful way of democratizing knowledge. So spreading as much information as possible in a way that feels relatable to people, that feels like they understand what you're saying. You're not filling it up with jargon and all this other stuff that doesn't make sense. You're just saying, hey, this is what I've lived through. This is what I did. And I hope you get something from it. So you're going to hear a lot about me. And at the end, you might be like, wow, I didn't need to know that maybe but i hope that you get some like you know some little seeds of knowledge and things that can help you reflect on your own life and things that you've experienced so i'll tell you the topic that i'm going to discuss within a story and then i finish um that with a piece that i read kind of close it out and then we'll open it for questions that leticia and i will talk to y'all about so this particular set of stories uh talks about the male gaze I talk about the white gaze. I specifically talk about the toxicity of raising girls to be wives and the myth of meritocracy. So um, I wasn't college bound. I was not. You know those people that do really well in school and they get all the honors and people love them and the teachers are always encouraging them. That wasn't me at all. I wanted to be that person, but I didn't get things. I didn't learn how other people did. And after trying so hard, I just stopped trying. And my parents were very much focused on, you're just gonna get married, like really young. And you're gonna be a pastora, like a pastor's wife. <laughs> and that was like all I could aspire to. And so I knew that all, all of my upbringing, when I brought good grades, it was kind of like, whew. when I brought back bad grades, it was like, whew. So I was like, but I can't. <laughs> so I wasn't college bound. And then I started to realize around junior year of high school, I was like, everybody's talking about college. Maybe I should, I should do that. That sounds like a thing I could try. <laughs> and I started asking questions. I had a 2.5 GPA. I said I wasn't a good student. And I went to my counselor and I, I figured that the kids were in AP classes, like advanced placements, they were the ones who got help with counselors to apply to college. So I was like, okay. So I filled up my request for the next year, six AP classes, six with a 2.5 GPA. And I brought it to my counselor and he was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he said some people are book smart and some people are are better at kinesthetically like they're better at moving and sports mind you this was a 5,000 people school I saw him once a year so by junior year I had seen him three times <laughs> and he was like you're a star athlete for sure you're not book smart and I was not a star athlete I was not any of those things <laughs> so I was just like okay, what do you do in public school if you want to get something and they don't want to give it to you? You bring your parents. So I was like, mommy, vas a ir a la escuela. My parents don't speak Spanish. I mean, don't speak English. They just speak Spanish. Uh, so I was like, mommy, vas a ir a la escuela y yo ir a la universidad. And she was like, what? And I was like, no te preocupes, just show up at this time because that's a period in the class that I want to be in and I'll make it work. And she showed up, the, like, out of anything, I have to say, I'll always appreciate that, that she showed up. Uh, and I remember I got called through the PA and I walked, I was so proud. I was like, I'm going to college. Like, I'm gonna be the first in my family to go to college in the United States. Like, how cool. I was like, en otro nivel. And I got to the counselor's office. She was sitting with him already. And, uh, <laughs> He was in a different mood, obviously. He knew, he knew how this works. And I just immediately sat down and I was like, she said to put me in the AP classes that I told you about yesterday. And he was very nice compared to what he was with me. But he said, um, because your parents don't speak the language, uh, we're afraid that you won't get help with school. And that means that we're gonna set you up for failure by putting you in these classes where they can't help you. And I was like, okay, how do I make my mom <laughs> look 
upset. So I was like, mommy, este hombre dice que soy estúpida. And que yo no tengo potencial. Que los mojicas, uh, my last name, que los mojicas no tienen potencial. And I was expecting, like my mom goes into a Leona mode. She like roars for her kids. But in that moment, it was like suddenly she was too immigrant. Like she didn't want to be raising hell. She didn't want to bring problems. And so she just looked down and then she looked up and looked at him and then looked at me and then again looked down and said, pues tal vez tiene razón. And I was floored. I was floored. And so I think the thing about immigration and trauma in our countries and being working class where you're always just surviving, like her wings had been clipped before she even knew she had them. So when she heard someone say something awful, ella dijo, I accept that narrative for my daughter then. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I quickly was like, she said, put me in those glasses no matter what. And he was shocked. He's like, are you sure? I didn't really catch that. I didn't really understand that that's what she said. And I was like, yeah, that's what she said. And he wrote a little contract on his PC. <laughs> uh, it was like this long. Uh, he like it printed out. He cut it because it was short. And it said that I fa if I failed out of, out of high school, that um, it was their fault. Like my parents were liable. The school had done whatever they could to prevent me from putting me in a situation where I was going to fail. And I was like, mami, eso dice que voy, voy a ir a la universidad. And she's like, okay. And she signed it. And I turned it in. And I ended up taking these classes. And I got a lot of help. And I figured out like FAFSA. How do you explain FAFSA to an immigrant kid? How do you explain, how do you explain to mommy, tell me what your taxes are? And she's like, what? <laughs> Mi papi was like, ¿Quién quiere saber eso? Like super overprotective. Like the whole concept is, was out of their grasp. And I was the first to do it. I had an older brother and he hadn't done it yet. He had started roofing at a company. So I was able to figure out that process and I was able to go to college. With a 2.5 GPA, I graduated still because I stayed on brand. <laughs> and I got into college and I started to do really, really well. I made dean's list back to back. I was on a presidential scholarship at one point. Like, I don't know what it was, but suddenly I was like, I love school. <laughs> and I, around halfway through it, I was like, oh, degrees, bachelor's degrees don't actually ensure you get a job. Eso no me dijeron. <laughs> like, I thought, they were like, you know, you make more if you get a, bad, a college degree. You get made, they tell you, like, statistics. If you graduate with your GD versus your high school diploma. Like, they sell this to you. So I was like, I'm going to make so much money with my bachelor's. No, I had an English literature bachelor's. And I started seeing people that graduated ahead of me working entry level positions that I could work without a bachelor's. So I was like, okay, I got to go to grad school. <laughs> I felt like it was like an L, you know, when Elle Woods and Legally Blonde, she's like, I'm going to go to Harvard. And everyone was like, what? That was me, but with like graduate school. I was like, I'm going to go to graduate school. And everyone around me was like, ¿Qué, qué se cree? Because that wasn't my context. That wasn't what I was projected to do. And uh, I remember telling me, mommy, we were, because I commuted for undergrad. Um, my undergrad was an HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. Those exist, by the way. I didn't know that. <laughs> but uh, I ended up uh, going to that HSI. And so I would, it was 15 minutes from my house. So I would drive there and come back. I never lived on campus. And so I told me, mommy, one day dinner, I was like, I think I'm going to get me my estria. And my, my dad was sitting next to her and he just laughed and he left the table. But the thing about me, mommy, is that she's like uh, psychically linked <laughs> to her kids because she's she knew I meant it. And so she's like, De aquí no te vas hasta que te cases. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, 
have to find a husband. <laughs> so <laughs> don't do this, y'all. I was, it was like January. I was like, okay, I'm dating someone casually. April, I told them I want to go to grad school. So I was like, hey, you want to get married? <laughs> so this person I dated in January, mind you, I wasn't allowed to date. He was a secret boyfriend this whole time. So I was like, I got to get married. I talked to him. I talked him into it, uh, which is terrible also. And then uh, in August, he came and asked for my hand in marriage at my house. Like I didn't script the whole thing and plan the whole thing. And then in, in December, we were married when applications were due. So <laughs> I ended up going to Vanderbilt University. Uh, I went to Nashville, Tennessee. I was shocked. It was the shock of my life. Um, I was raised in Miami. Miami is like in the 70 percentile of Latinx. Like you see people like you everywhere. English is optional in Miami, especially in the areas where our people live. So my parents, that's why they don't know English. <laughs> they could get away with speaking Spanish to everyone. So I moved to Nashville and the percentage is 7% of Latinx. And so I didn't see anyone that looked like me, that sounded like me, that dressed like me, that like expressed themselves con las manos like me, anything. And I was like, oh, okay, this is different. <laughs> but I was like, I'm here to learn. I was on a scholarship. I'm like, let's go. Uh, and then I started to fail out of my graduate program. I started getting C's and D's. And I remember my first written paper, um, it was marked with red ink everywhere. And at the end, it said, you need to go to the writing center. And I was like, Que paso? But me tragué, me tragué like my pride because I didn't have the option to fail out of grad school. I got married to go to grad school. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll go to the writing center. I'll figure it out. I went to the writing center. I had booked an appointment. The way it worked at that time is that you, you book an appointment online, you email them your essay or essays that you need them to look over. And then when you show up, they do all the edits live. So I showed up and I'm like, I'm here to see somebody about my essay. And the girl in the front was like, oh, there's a note next to your name. It says that uh, your writing problems, your errors in writing are of someone whose English is a second language. And we don't help with that kind of um, errors. We don't do that. You have to go to the International Writing Center. And I was shocked because I was an English literature major. <laughs> I, writing papers was all I did in undergrad. I was like, was my bachelor's a lie? Like, how do, what do you mean I don't know how to write? What does that even mean? <laughs> so I was like, no, me lo traje otra vez. I'm like, you know what? I can't have pride here. I got a pass. So I do the same whole thing. I send in my essay. I do an appointment. I show up. And okay, the normal students writing center is like in the middle of campus. Like everybody knows where it is. The International Student Writing Center was like, you had to take a golf cart to get there. And it was in the corner of a building really, really far off campus. Um, so I was like, okay, I see what you're telling me here, but okay, I go anyways. I show up and the girl at the front says, there's notes here. And it says that um, you speak fluently, you're writing like a fluent English speaker. So we can't help you. We have, we don't, we're understaffed. We have more students than we can help. You need to go to the normal writing center. <laughs> and I was like, mentira. This isn't, this isn't real life. This can't be real life. And so my anxiety started at, being the good girl who did what my parents wanted me to do all the time. <laughs> my anxiety started in being the minority when I hadn't felt that way for ever until I got to Nashville. So I wrote this piece because I needed to remind myself that I was worthy to, and I deserved to be there and I was brilliant. A thing that I was told constantly through these instances that I was not. So I'm gonna read you this story and then we'll jump into a Q&A, but 
Some days you will forget that your mommy is brilliant and strong because of the accent in her tongue and her cultural differences. Some days you're gonna forget that your papi is hardworking and resilient because he's so hardworking. And everyone says, if you work hard, you can make it, but how come he hasn't made it then? Some days you will forget that you are capable because of the barrio that you come from and the clothes that you wear. Some days you, all, you will forget that you are smart because you might stutter when you speak English in front of native English speakers. Some days you will forget that our music is an important contribution to society. Our family music is salsa, bachata, merengue, rancheras, and that will all be devalued in society and it's generally misunderstood. Some days you will forget that your abuelita is sharp and witty because of how she upholds your cultura's religions. Some days you will forget that oppressed communities have been using laughter to deal with their oppression for centuries. Instead, you'll get kicked out of bars and libraries and coffee shops, restaurants. You're gonna be told you're too much, you're too loud, you're taking up too much space. Some days you will be made to think that you're not good enough to go to the fancy schools and they'll begin to question you when you begin to thrive. So I got my first A in my graduate program from a black womanist scholar named Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas. And I was so happy. I'm a Leo, so I tell everybody all my accomplishments. <laughs> so I was like, everybody, I got my first A. Like, I'm doing it. I'm going to survive graduate school. And I remember my first friend told me, um, it's because uh, Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas only gives good grades to students of color. But remember that you have been outshining and outliving all for some time now. And we're entering spaces that aren't meant for us in mass. And we're going to excel. We're showing everyone what all of this diaspora excellence looks like in their spaces. And it's up to them to make us forget. So let me remind you, for every time you've been frustrada at your nonprofit or frustrated at your corporate job that you are the sum of generational resistance. You are the sun, the moon, and the stars. Not, not just one of them, you're all of them. You have never stopped being great. Your ancestors have always been great, and we cannot forget that. But for some reason, we will. It's, it's embedded in the system that we forget. So in order to move forward, we have to look at what's really happening here. So if you all have a pen and paper, I really, really suggest you look up things like the history of Chiquita Banana. Um, look up the things like the Panama Canal. Look up international trade policies like NAFTA and CAFTA. Remember the border walls. There's government documents that state that in Arizona, there's a gap that was left open on purpose in the worst parts of the desert so that migrant workers would be funneled through it and that hopefully mother nature will get rid of them. This is all written. Google things like syphilis experiments in California on Mexican American women and forced sterilizations. This has all happened. There's a system in place that thrives off of our self-doubt. But some days I know all this to be true and I still forget. I feel inferior when I walk into a bar and every white person looks at me like they've never seen someone like me before. I feel dumb when I'm talking to somebody and I tell them I went to Vanderbilt and they're like, no way. Uh, and I question my own spiritual and outer beauty, and I have to constantly remind myself that my brownness has always been brilliant and beautiful. And I have to remind myself that everything else is a lie, 
a very strategic lie told by powerful people meant to keep people like me down, quiet, bien portados. So remember that you deserve to be brilliant for you and for all of us. Thank you, Prisca. Yeah. Really powerful story. I, I, it just makes me think too, especially for all the women on this call and all the, the other uh, guests on the call, no matter how much we achieve, we always wonder, should we be there? So I'm wondering if you could share a little, how do you find when you are, on the days that you need, re need reminders, how do you find them? Uh, I have really good systems in place now. So I have my friends. I say it like we need each other. You can't do this alone. So I have a group chat that I just, I, quite, I, I sent them. I'm like, was, I, was this dumb? Was this actually dumb? Because <laughs> I'm being made, because you get gaslit a lot. And, you're, and you start to question it and you start to feel a little bit loca. And so I'll, I'll ask, I'll do check-ins with people I trust, people I know who have my best interest in mind, people I know that aren't gonna fluff my feathers for no reason. <laughs> so I, so find, find your people and, and check in with them as often as possible. Thank you. And before we um, go into your next story, I just want to remind folks to feel free to chat questions into the Q&A, but I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this is the first time I'm talking about this as bluntly as I am. I've always talked about colorism. It's very important for me to talk about colorism as someone who, like, I don't present white no matter what I do. I tried. Trust me. I tried. <laughs> y siempre. It was like, where are you from? <laughs> so uh, colorism is a really important topic. This, in this uh, story, I'm gonna talk about anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, colorism, uh, known as uh, pigmentocracy. So the politics of pigmentation, pigmentation being the color of your skin, and in proximity to whiteness. I was always the little girl who was called India as a slur. In our communities, that's a very common slur that we use. India and negra are two big common slurs we use in our community. And so it, I think it's important for us to realize that Latinidad is an ethnicity. It's not a race. And we are a spectrum of people. We can be Black and we can even be blonde, blue-eyed. That is Latinidad in its full spectrum. So I wanted to talk about this because um, I grew up being told about my descendants from Spain a lot, like too much. Like I don't have, it isn't even like I have a tia who lives in Spain. No, like <laughs> nobody it, that I, anyone can think of in the history of speaking people that are alive today, nobody can say like, yeah, I've even been to Spain, nothing. But they're like, there's a town in España que se llama Mojica, and that's where we're from. And that, that was it. And we lived it. We drank the Kool-Aid. We were like, lo creo with all my heart. This is who my people are Spanish. The, and that it just is not, is not accurate. And I experienced that, especially like, I remember growing up in Univision in Telemundo, when Sofia Vergara was blonde. Um, Talia was on... Univision, Telemundo, Gloria Trevi, Shakira, Shusha was my, the love of my life when I was a little girl, I had Shusha shoes. None of those Latinas look anything like me. None of them. That was the representation that I was fed. And thankfully there's a lot that's changed now, but only very recently. And I'm gonna say in the last two years that we've gotten more representation, um, things like Netflix, but Univision and Telemundo still, they're very, very white presenting or white adjacent. And that is like the goal that we're supposed to aspire for. But I remember seeing India Maria and me papi being like, that, that's what you look like. And I was like, yeah, that's true. But like, she's also not being portrayed very um, positively. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> so I think it's important that we keep that in mind. Colorism exists we aspire to be white as a community. That is, that is fact. So uh, an example is Susan Smith, if you all haven't heard of her, 
she's a white woman in 1994 who um, killed her two children uh, and then blamed it on a black man, a fictitious black man that never existed. Uh, Amy Cooper recently, we heard about Amy Cooper. She was in New York City in Central Park. Her dog was not on a leash in an area of the park that should that the dog should have been on a leash. And she was caught live in a video um, threatening to tell, to call the police on a black man who said, leash your dog. A very uh, understandable request, a very much in line with the law request, pero se enojo because how dare a black man tell her what to do. And I remember everybody just flooded to the Amy Cooper story and was like, que horrible es esa mujer. I can't believe she did that. But did you know that that same week, a Latina in Miami did the same exact thing that Susan Smith did in 1994? A Latina named Patricia Ripley, immigrant in Miami, killed her son and then told the police that her son was abducted by two black men and eventually confessed that that was all made up. And I say all this to say that being linked to your Spanish ancestors is proximity to whiteness. And Patricia Ripley aligning herself with white people by, by inventing this fictitious black man is another example of a thing that our community does, our non-Black community wants to align itself with whiteness as much as we can for survival. Colonized people are, are, we were murdered if we weren't aligning with them. Those are very real reasons we were surviving, but also it's, it's out of a place of pain. Colonized people are responding to pain. Regardless of that, we need to undo that. And undoing that is um, understanding that mi lucha es la lucha of our Black community within the Latinx community and outside the Latinx community. Our liberation is connected to others' liberation. So this piece is going to sound common. Uh, mi mami, uh, this isn't a ref um, like a reflection on like me mommy's horrible. This is like something that I, a lot of us grew up with. So this is called the politics of pigmentation and it's about colorism. So me mommy tells me to get out the sun. Me mommy tells me to put on sunblock. Me mommy tells me to not go to the beach so much. And she's not protecting me from skin cancer. She's telling me to stay out of, the sun, out of the sun because she doesn't want me to be too brown. She doesn't want me to look more indígena. You see, mi mami is from the mountains of Hinotea in my country. The mountains where the temperature stays at a cool 60 degrees Fahrenheit, foggy, and everyone wears sweaters year round. Mi mami, like many of her townspeople, is really light skinned. In fact, her, her darkest shade when she tans is the color of the inside of my arm, you know, like the lightest color that we can have. <laughs> That's me, mommy, tanning. Uh, <laughs> but she's not as light skinned. She's the oldest girl. She's not as light skinned as her siblings. And the joke that I grew up hearing toda mi vida was la raza mejoró con cada hijo that mi abuela had. Mi abuelo, her dad, is, has green eyes, light ash blonde hair, and is really light skinned. But we all talk about, y quien va a tener los ojos verdes? Like it is the aspiration of a lifetime. I found out that mi tatarabuela is Afro-Nicaragüense when I was 30. I never heard of that, but I heard so much about these green eyes all of my life. That's a problem. I have mi papi's genes. I don't look like mi mami at all. Mi papi's side of the family is darker. They have black brown hair, straight, straight black brown hair, brown skin, indigenous features, 
And Mipapi's not afraid of his brownness. Instead, he loves them. He sits in the sun and he's like, que rico, que quema. Like he loves it. <laughs> and you'll, and my mom in the same, in the same scene, my mom will be next to him with gorros and long sleeves and pants she, and under a sombrilla, I mean, a sombrilla, cause she's like, aquí no se puede uno poner más oscuro. <laughs> but mi papi's a man. And the standards of admiration in my context is is about how much he can provide and take care of his family. Mi mami, on the other hand, she has to be somebody to someone through her aesthetics, preferably her wider aesthetics. Mi mami tells me to get out the sun. Mi mami tells me to put on sunblock. Mi mami tells me to not go to the beach so much because I have mi papi's brownness, but mi mami's gender, a curse. I was born female and brown and a cultura that hates women and especially hates the darker ones. But avoiding the sun feels unnatural and distasteful. Knowing full well what's happening. It took me a while to figure out what was happening and when I figured it out, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Mi mami tells me to get out the sun my mommy tells me to put on some black. She tells me to not go to the beach so much. And she tells me, te estás poniendo negra with rechazo in her tone. But I, I cannot undo the fact that my skin absorbs the sun rays like magic. My skin turns vitamin D into nutrients and I glow in the sun. You ask me what the color of my skin tone is and I'll tell you, oh, is, is Mayan gold? I do not burn in the sun. I evolve right before your eyes. My brown skin is beautiful. And in the winter, it becomes a lighter shade. And in the summer, it darkens. I have to change my makeup with the seasons to match my supernatural skin tone. Mi mommy tells me to get out the sun. She tells me to put on sunblock. She tells me to not go to the beach so much. And I ignore her. That's it for that story. <laughs> that's it. I might be like, that's it. <laughs> There's so much to unpack there. Um, I know that we have another story, but just it really, it, you're right. That is a universal story. I can't think of a single Latina who has not been in that conversation, whether fighting against it or perpetuating it. So I, I really appreciate you bringing it up. It's not a new fight for us. It's like ongoing ones. I really appreciate that. I'm actually really excited about the next story and I'm curious to see how you'll set it up, but particularly under this Latinas Leave format, it's like we struggle with how we define ourselves and but also how we define our success in relation to our family. So I'm really excited to hear this, this next and last story from you. Yeah, I had a really contentious relationship with my mommy. And so it was, it was, it was really interesting to figure out a way to name it all because it took, so remember the guy that I got married to to go to grad school that I told you all about? I got divorced <laughs> <laughs> uh, because things happen when you do things like that. Um, uh, so this, this story is gonna touch on topics of around Western standards of excellence, uh, colonial institutions that devalue womanhood and the male gaze. Um, which are really intense things in and of itself, but it, I'll make it normal. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I got divorced and I, I kept going in my program. I got divorced halfway. And then um, when I was graduating, I actually applied to another program, a master's program, and I got in. And then I remember when they called me to tell me I was in because they, I had a, a full fellowship and like living stipends, everything. And I, I cried, I sobbed, because um, having attended a colonial institution known as academia, I, I changed a lot and I, I felt like I broke parts of myself to fit in as an immigrant. I just, there's this deep desire to want to not be different. And I, I fed into it. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to assimilate as much as I could. And it ended up killing me inside. So I remember calling me mommy after that 
I was told that I was getting, I got in and I was like, I don't know if I can do it. I mean, mommy's traditional. Her kids are her responsibility to her dying breath. And so she's like, pues venite a casa. And I was like, <laughs> what does it mean to move back with my still Pentecostal pastoral parents home as an adult woman who was actively dating, actively trying to find what was next for me, actively just defying everything they ever thought would happen in my life. And so I, I, I was like, you know what? I set a certain set of rules. I was like, mommy, like, don't open my mail. <laughs> You know, basic things that weren't a given when I was living at home. So I was like, mommy, don't open my mail. If the door is closed, knock. You know, little things that I was like, boundaries. Let's create boundaries that are healthy. But I went back. And I went back like I was, always, I was the ultima Coca-Cola del mundo. Like I went back like I have a master's. Y'all can't touch me. And uh, I, I made that mistake of, of ha being, accepting the colonial framework that told me that I was better because I had all these accolades that were given to me by white institutions. So I Miami mean, checked me really, really, really quickly. <laughs> uh, I didn't, we didn't grow up with a good relationship. Uh, we only got closer when I got divorced because I, I call, I remember when I got divorced, I didn't call them because I knew it, un divorcio en una casa pastoral is el pecado más grande. Like it's the biggest sin I could have done to get divorced. So I, I left my ex-husband, moved into a basement room and in an inflatable bed when I had finally situated my things, I called me mommy and I was like, mommy, I left him and she said, que hiciste? Immediately. Never, something must have happened, tell me everything. It was like, it was all your fault, it must be. So I, I had a reckoning. I, I told her, she, she called me a bunch of names. She said, uh, las mujeres que leen no se casan, uh, las mujeres inteligentes, nadie las quiere, a bunch of things. And I hung up. I was like, and I immediately got online and changed my number. They didn't know where I was living. These are too big. We used to talk about an hour a day before that. These are too big nonos with your Latina mommies. <laughs> she didn't know where I was. She didn't know how to reach me. And uh, for three months, I didn't talk to her. Um, my sister and I started talking again. And my mommy's meant to be in the FBI. I'm so convinced about this. And she, this is when your cell phones, it wasn't a face recognition, it was just the code. It was like four codes at the time. And um, she learned my sister's codes and got into her phone, hacked her phone <laughs> and texted me, te quiero mucho, es tu mami. And I was like, it changed, it changed everything for me. But that was all through the phone. Like it wasn't me living in the same house. So our relationship had changed drastically. She had, me, my dad disowned me and she had stepped up and said, you're my daughter hasta el día que me muera. So I wrote this piece because even when she had ex overextended herself for me, I still showed up telling her she's not better than me. I'm better than her. And uh, this is the story that I wrote. Uh, I'm not better than me, mommy, <laughs> which is a lesson I had to learn. And I, I fear a lot of us have to learn this. Um, mi mami's not terca, nor is she ignorant, nor is she someone I need to teach all of my knowledge, forcefully or even at all. Mi mami is a fountain of knowledge and wisdom that I was taught to not value. I have a mommy who loves me, despite how much she has tried to indoctrinate me into being una mujer virtuosa. She is a product of her time, and her limitations to her, where I have been and where I'm going is entirely different than she could have ever imagined, ever. It's entirely different than I was ever allowed to imagine. And when I was younger, I resisted her and I argued with her nonstop. 
era una malcriada. I felt like she suffocated me, not because she was more aggressive than me, papi. That had nothing to do with it. Rather, I valued her less. And I felt like her guidance was a burden. And yet, I have been able to do things no one in my family has ever dreamt of doing. And I thought it made me more special than the other women in my life. I thought it made me more special than other brown immigrant women. And then one day, I remember coming downstairs. Um, mi mami eats uh, a pan con mantequilla with cafe every morning. And it's her quiet time. And you don't, you don't bug her. This is her quiet time. So I go down. I'm not saying anything. I'm like, buenos dias. And I'm just moving around. And she's like, sentate. And I was like, <gasps> is that tone when you know they're calling you into a meeting? I was like, oh, no. And she just looked at me. And she said, yo no soy estupida. And it shattered me. It's like she knew that I was internalizing, that she wasn't good enough. And she was right. I thought she was too emotional, too irrational, too much not like me. Not like the me I was told to prefer. I have a mommy who dreams of our mistakes before they happen, which I hated growing up. Hated. She'd be like, no te, no te montes en ese avión. I'm like, mom, I can't get a refund. Like that. She's like, yo me desperté y yo sé que tú tienes un ticket. Like, I'm, her spirituality and her feelings and her warnings have been more right than wrong that I used to hate it. I used to be embarrassed of it often because she would say it in front of friends and stuff. And I was like, mommy. But I have a mommy who has kept a part of her spirituality alive, a non-mainstream type of spirituality that is messy and it's unpredictable and which goes against everything that a European type of Christianity that we were taught to align ourselves with. When mi papi thought he was diabetic, mi mommy said, <laughs> you got to pee in a bowl and put it outside. Y si en la mañana there's a bunch of hormigas on it, then you have diabetes. <laughs> and we all laughed at her. <laughs> and then I remember when he went to get checked eventually, uh, the doctor said, oh yeah, a lot of people do that because that, uh, there's sugar in your, in your urine. <laughs> like valuable information we completely mocked her for. <laughs> and me mommy is smart, like wicked smart. And she doesn't devalue ancestral knowledge the way that modernity has taught us to devalue ancestral knowledge. And somehow for decades, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it at all. And when I got all these degrees, I just forgot it. And when my mommy read my mind that day, I knew exactly what I was thinking without ever, when she knew exactly what I was thinking without ever saying it, she pulled me back the veil of superiority se me quitó inmediatamente, and I saw this woman fight for her daughter to see her outside of these impossible narratives of pomposity. I saw a mommy demand for respect out of someone she had learned to respect, and I felt embarrassed. I mean, mommy is where she is today because she's a survivor. She grew up in an abusive household that she ran away from, and she received the education she was given access to. She wanted to be other things. She wanted to be a detective, which I'm telling you she would have been great at. The FBI lost a gem. Mi mami couldn't become those things because she grew up really poor and she ran away from a house that was abusive and had kids really soon. So she decided to love the person she did become, mi mami, and that is powerful. So the minute that my education begins to make me look down at her, I have failed her. And my education has failed me. Not only that, it specifically failed to teach me how to treat people with compassion. Mi mami disagrees. If you talk to her right now, she'd be like, mm. she disagrees with a lot of the things that I have, the person that I have become. 
in more ways than I can name, more ways. Uh, my mommy prefers that I was panzona with like four kids by now, at home, cooking meals for everybody, matándome for my household. And my mommy has looked at me in the eyes and said, y cuando te mueras, ¿quién te va a cuidar? Because I don't have kids. Um, but my mommy also has a glow in her eyes when she hears about me speaking to people and sharing my stories. My mommy has told my sister when my dad has mistreated her. Si Priscila estuviera aquí, ella me hubiera defendido. And I'm proud of her. I'm proud that she has always fought. She knows no man's gonna treat me like she is treated, like some of her friends are treated, like some of her friend's daughters are treated. Mi mami knows she raised no pendeja and she's proud of me for it. Mi mami has mirrored resistance for me. She's where I got it from and I didn't, I failed to see that for years. She, she doesn't win arguments often at home. The decisions are made without her input more than, more than they should. And she has pataleado and screamed through it all. I have learned from her resistance to not accept what people tell me to do. I've learned to resist shame and resist control. Mi mami, would tell me how a partner should treat you by sampling from her own marriage. When I was young, I knew that no man should ever lay hands on you. And that men shouldn't make executive decisions in a shared household. And that a true partnership demands mutual respect. And I know all this because whenever she was wronged, she took me aside and she would say, eso no se hace, tú no vas a tolerar eso. She stayed, but she illustrated with her words a reality for me that I could imagine, a re-existence that was different than hers. I am the product of the migration and their sweat and tears, and although my mommy doesn't understand me, she believes in me because she believes in, so, in herself enough to fight, and that is the fight that I carry doing this kind of work. I'm not better than me, mommy, but I have opportunities at my fingertips that she could never dream of. And I cannot forget that it is me, mommy, that I have to thank for my possibilities. Because while they both moved us here, she, she was the one who raised me. And she protected me when I had no concept of what I was being protected against. So I say that I am me, mommy's revolution. And what I mean when I say that is that I am who she could not become. I am because of her and everything I do is for her. I no longer want the approval of, of man. I no longer want the acceptance of the church, the acceptance that comes from assimilating and all the other things that embraced me conditionally. And if we're not both good enough, and devalued through whatever system that is in place and I do not want it. And I learned that from her. That is me mommy's revolution and my own. Wow. Thank you, Priska. Um, and not just thank you, like thanks for doing it. Thank you because you're right. This feels like talking entre mujeres at the table. And sometimes when I hear you read, I'm like, is she talking about herself or is she talking about me? How does she know such intimate things about me? Um, and I'm seeing that in the chat here, women are just chiming in like, that's me, I've had that story. And you've, your writing is so powerful because it makes us feel seen and feel seen in a way that we're not ascribing to someone else's standard of feeling seen, but feeling seen like your sister sees you, like your mom sees you. So I would just want to thank you for that. I, I, I see myself when I hear those stories, like 
Uh, I think my mom would say I'm the difficult daughter, but now as a mom of an 18 year old, I'm like, I think I'm changing who the protagonist is as I hear your stories. So <laughs> just owning that. And, um, I, I, I know we're over time, but I did not want to stop you at all in, in sharing these stories because they are so powerful. What I appreciated about the three selections that you took us on a journey um, of self-introspection and the in the reminders and the struggles we all know also about colorism and how how subtle it is that we don't even think about it and it's just part of who we are and, and really owning and hey we, we've got some space and place to grow too um, it's not all about what other folks are doing to us it's how we are hurting ourselves but then in in the last reading and this reckoning we have where we're we're not only going like in your story i hear going from childhood to adulthood but of the competing cultures and how that impacts our perceived values of our success but also how we paint our parents and it was just it was beautiful to see and it's beautiful to like i resonate with that hey i'm not stupid i know what's going on like and that reality check of like well shit, maybe i'm stupid <laughs> see how I was feeling. I, I just want to thank you for that because I, I know um, as someone who appreciates literature, I know that you as a writer, that's you are putting yourself out there. So just first of all, on, on behalf of like the, the series and Pepina's lead and Jose Ossie, like just thank you for that. <sighs> thank uh, you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was a lot. I'm trying not to cry, but if I do, you know, whatever. I'll be okay with that. <laughs> There are a lot of questions coming in and I apologize that we will not be able to get to all of them. I do though, while I'm looking for maybe one or two to bring up, I'd love if you could just let folks know where they can find your writings and how they can find out more about you. Yeah, um, Latina Rebels on all social media. Just type out Latina Rebels and Prisca Lorcas on all social medias also. And you can follow the updates on my book. Those are some stories that will be in it. A lot more dense, but it'll be it'll be very exhaustive. <laughs> <laughs> one real quick question. I, I saw this one come up earlier, and I wanted to ask. I'd love to. How do you define? You, you mentioned Latino rebels. How do you define Latino Re rebel? Is it a movement? Is it more of a lifestyle? Um, and how do Latino rebels connect to others uh, in their communities and out in the world? Um, well, the Latino Rebels, I created because in 2013, I was in this predominantly white city in this predominantly white university. And it was about like, I, it has to be other people who feel like I feel. It was like a sense of creating community, even if it was online. And in 2013, that was really radical. There weren't other pages like ours, you know, <laughs> like the Me Too wasn't around. Remesca was around, but it was really different. Um, and other than that, we had Latino rebels. I remember like News Taco or there were Gosamos. There were different little small publications, but they were very localized to whatever region the founders were at or whatever. Um, so yeah, I was just like, there has to be other people like me, uh, other immigrants who are, who are it, it feels like growing pains living in the United States a lot. <laughs> and so I was like, other people who feel the growing pains, also other people who aren't gonna, that are questioning everything. That isn't just like, I'm questioning the church. No, that they're just like, maybe this whole university thing is a little not for me and not made for me. Like there was, I wanted to be in community with people who were thinking bigger and thinking wider than, than what I was receiving any other place. So it's, it's, it's a place to build community. And I hope that I can continue to do that. I'm always looking for new artists. I'm looking for people who nobody knows about. Because even now that we've gotten more visibility, we see like the 10 same people <laughs> being visible. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like we got to I remember when I discovered Jessica Salgado, she ever discovered her on Tumblr. And she, like we posted her a few times, but her content is amazing. And she blew up. <laughs> she has three books now. <laughs> so it's that and for me, it was always like find find people who are doing great things and just plug them into this network and see what happens, see who's, whose life can change, who can create different things in different communities on their own. How many things can we spawn off of this little thing <laughs> that I wanted 
just to build. Great. Um, another question I wanted to ask from, from the chat is, what could you say to those of us who are the first Latinas, first uh, you know, women of color to lead in power positions or who are sitting at the decision-making table? What advice would you give? <laughs> I think we get so scared of burning hypothetical bridges that are never there. And what I mean by that is that um, like some Remezcla stuff came up recently. I don't know if y'all are following it, but some stuff around Remezcla and the founder came up. And I'm, I, I was talking to a few of my friends who are visible Latinas creating online and everyone was kind of saying that they were fearful of speaking up because what if they lost opportunities? And I was like, I get that, but I know for a fact that Remezcla knows I exist and has never highlighted my work. So I'm not burning a bridge because that bridge was never there. <laughs> there are people who will support your work and then there's people that we hope will support our work. If the people we hope to support our work are being toxic and racist and homoph homophobic, xenophobic, whatever it could be, don't be afraid to burn that bridge because chances are they were never trying to build a bridge with you anyways. I think we get, we get bogged down. We don't, we don't speak up enough because we're worried about what could happen, the potential of what we, the, pos the possibilities we would have cut off. But I've built a career from burning bridges and I think it's a very fun career to have so far. <laughs> so the more of us burn bridges, I hope with the ashes, we can build a makeshift bridge that will lead to each other. Well, thank you for that. And, and thank you so much again for uh, sharing so much with, with us today. Apologize to folks that we did not get to all the questions, but I, I mean, I don't know if you could see the chat while you were reading, but people were just hooked. <laughs> so thank you Lisa, for sharing this time with us. Good luck with the book. Thank uh, you. Remind us, when can we find it on the shelf so we won't we'll be out? It's, so I just turned my first draft of the whole manuscript. So we're on editing stages and it, it's gonna move really quickly. But as soon as I have a day, I'll put it everywhere. So follow me on social media and you'll know quickly. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. And I'd also um, like to invite folks to join us for the third Latinas Lead virtual leadership session, which is taking place July 29th from four to 5.30. Um, the topic will be current trends and leadership styles for Latinas and will feature award-winning author Juana Bordas, uh, hosted by LMV senior fellows Francis Coleman and Patricia Varela Rivera. So on behalf of LCFC, Latinas Lead Giving Circles, LMV Fellows, and Inspire Next 50 Initiative and Excel Energy, I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank again our featured speaker, Kino Briska. Um, thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye. Good time. I feel alive. I, 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 and the world.